for Rogers Media, diverse set of assets. Kobe Gullerson, Director of Digital Marketing for MasterCard Worldwide, uh, responsible for all B2B and B2C uh, digital communications in the Canada region. So just to kind of set this up, at Interbrand, we really believe in two fundamental things about brands. The first is that brand is the most important uh, economic asset that a business owns. And the second thing is that brands have the power to change the world as you've seen in the previous slide. So if you kind of combine these two ideas together, you can really create a very powerful brand strategy that can deliver on business fundamentals. Um, those real behaviors that we're talking about driving and when we align them with business strategy are really three things. One is driving choice. The second is the ability to command a premium price point for our products and services. And the third thing is to engender loyalty. So all three of these things really sort of ladder up to what we talk about as ROI or sort of return on our business invest in investment. And that's really the role that digital can play um, in building a strong brand strategy. Um, as we mentioned before, there are a lot of tools at our disposal today. We tend to get focused on the current shiny penny or the new tool that's out there. There's a lot of problems with focusing on tools before we think about changing behavior. Um, the least of which is this idea that uh, people are afraid of tools, they're afraid of the investment in tools, they might not understand the tools, so we start to relegate those responsibilities to different parts of the organization, and we lose sight of the customer. The notion that behavior at the end of the day and creating influence is really what we're after. So for today, we're gonna kind of flip these things around and not talk about tools, and we're really gonna dive a little bit deeper into behaviors so we can um, start to think about how to think about digital in a different way. Um, at Interbrand, we think about brands this way. So you're probably familiar with our Best Global Brands report that we publish every year. So it's a ranking of the, of the top 100 brands in the world. And underneath that ranking is a, is a framework called Brand Strength. So it's sort of the, the DNA of all strong brands as we see it and we've studied it over the years. Um, there's a couple of interesting things about this framework. The first is that um, from a digital perspective, a lot of brands think that presence is the key to building a strong digital brand strategy. So to be everywhere is to be a great digital brand. Um, but if you, as you look here, there's sort of nine other dimensions that often get overlooked about the quality and the experience around our digital strategy. The second interesting thing about this framework is it's both internal and external because strong brands start on the inside. So we often don't talk about digital strategy as starting inside the organization or that internally that's half of the social media equation is actually connecting the people inside the organization with the people outside the organization. So it becomes a pretty powerful framework to think about digital comprehensively. So we did that, um, and in this past year we did a study of about 800 uh, leaders of digital strategy within some of the world's biggest brands to understand exactly um, where they're struggling with digital in their own opinion. So what we did was uh, we pulled four of the findings from that study. It actually, it's published in, uh, today on our site, and also um, there's a printed version of it around the room on some tables that you can take a look at or visit our site to learn more about uh, the details. But essentially, these were the four big findings that we wanted to share with you, to not only share but have our panel help us work through how they're dealing with some of the biggest challenges in delivering sort of world-changing brands today from a digital perspective. So the first finding is really on the internal dimension of commitment. Um, the finding here is really one in three claimed that they have an inadequate amount of resources dedicated to the company's digital efforts. So if you're, if you're representing digital for a large brand, this probably rings home. If you are in the service of large, large brands, this is also very important to note that um, working through this sort of internal issues is really key to delivering on a powerful strategy. So. Um, with that, we're going to talk to Rob over at Bloomberg to see you know, how his company is dealing with commitment inside of their organization. Thanks. It's the green one at the top. Um, hopefully I get this right. So um, again, my name is Rob Harles. I run uh, social media for Bloomberg, which only a year and a half ago didn't exist. Um, Bloomberg existed. I didn't exist in Bloomberg. Um, but it, it raised a lot of interesting questions when I first got started. It, and one of the things, uh, if someone knows about my background, is I've done social media uh, at Sears Holdings. I was at Comscore. I was in, I was in um, McKinsey before that. And um, all those things kind of led me up to this point with Bloomberg, um, which is an interesting company. Um, you know, 30 years old, focuses very much on um, 
the financial markets, not a lot of people have a clear understanding of the brand unless they're in financial markets or deal with money globally. But it's a very um, august brand. And um, long story short, the uh, CMO of Sears had left Sears a number of years ago to go to Bloomberg. And uh, at, at, at this was an interesting point, too, which they, they didn't actually have a marketing organization either in their 30-year history. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine what it was like uh, dealing with this organization that um, was very focused on the one thing, which is their jewel in the crown, the terminal. Uh, but coming in, one thing led to another. I, I was asked to, to join, the, join the company. And, and I thought what was really interesting about it when I first joined is I felt distinctly that we'd been here before. Um, and sorry about the baby picture, but. I have babies on my mind at the moment. I'm about to be a dad in, in a few weeks. Um, so now I start seeing babies everywhere and think, oh, they're cute. I'll put those in, in my presentations. Um, but I felt distinctly like we'd been here before with social media. And if, if you go back, it's interesting to see the, the quotes you have from the days of the early internet or the days yeah. of even the telephone. Uh, there was actually a quote that I found. It was in the 19th century. Uh, it was a, a New York Presbyterian minister who was decrying the telephone as, 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 as something, a device that was going to literally stop people from going to church. They would actually phone it in. They wouldn't <laughs> go to church anymore. Um, so you can imagine that we've been down this path before and dealing with organizations like Bloomberg um, that are trying to wrestle with new media. It's, it's kind of a, an interesting chore. Um, you, you kind of start off trying to at least tell them that um, there's a, uh, you know, th that their compatriots, their competitors are doing all these things. You try to build these wonderfully complex um, um, uh, presentations about why they should be involved in this, um, but nothing tends to stir their, stir their imagination. Um, so, and let's see if I go ahead. So here's one of the charts that I showed them early on saying, hey, everybody's really thinking about this stuff. We should be thinking about it too. Uh, there was a thought when I came in that, um, you know, at the very least, uh, we should have someone who would at least tell us what's going on. Whether we would do anything about it is another matter, but we should have someone coming who would tell us what's going on. So that was my first role for a few weeks. And then someone said something to me that was interesting, which was, um, it was the CEO of the company, said, you know what, take some time. Don't think about this as a revolution. Think about it as something else. Take, take some time to get to know people first, which in many ways should be the first tenant of social. Yeah. Right, getting to know people. Bell should have gone off on that one. Um, so I started thinking about it, talking to people, going around the organization, figuring out what was really important to them, putting my McKinsey cap back on, my Comscore cap, not even talking about social per se. And what it dawned on me is that if we were going to be successful within a company like Bloomberg in, in really driving social media, we would have to think about it not in terms of revolution, not even evolution, but it's more of an infection. And so I know that's kind of a disgusting idea, but, but it's actually uh, stayed me in good stead uh, because as we thought about it, we thought about the business first, and then we thought about how we use social media to support the business. That's actually been extremely successful. And when I talk to people around the organization, I talk to them not in social speak, I talk to them in business speak, which is also a nice way to get their immune system down <laughs> so that they're not attacking you. Uh, thinking about specifically what their biggest issue is from a, a business perspective and then trying to work to figure out how social media supports that. So I always say keep it real. Uh, keep it in the context of, of the things that are important to the people you're serving within the organization and then you can start doing things that will, will help, um, help what you're trying to further. The long and short of it is that um, uh, if I fast forward a year and a half, uh, and there are lots and lots of things that we measure. We measure every week. We have a scorecard. We started doing everything from the beginning as a way of proving out that there's value in the organization. But we, one thing we started doing is really putting it in the context of what the business thinks is valuable. And so we built this, this value chain, as it were, um, that we kind of uh, goaltend and score keep. And uh, everything from we're driving traffic to .com, which converts into advertising revenue. When we first started, we had less than a half a percent of traffic to .com. Now we're at uh, we're nearly six percent of total traffic to .com. That can be converted and monetized. We even were able to do things with the sales force by teaching them how to use social media to go fish um, and drive leads that then turned into to real sales, and nothing gets people's attention, certainly within Bloomberg, but I'm assuming most core organizations, than saying we actually were able to sell something from the activities that we did. We may have been able to sell them anyway without social, but it would have taken longer or it would have been more securitous. 
So, you know, we've started thinking about this in the context of how do we actually drive value for the organization. So the thing I'll leave you with, and then we can talk about other things later, is um, I, I kind of came up, stole this from Peter Drucker, it was about a business, and then I kind of bastardized the whole thing. <laughs> and, and basically I said, you know, the, he, he had said that the point of a business is to create a customer. Uh, what I would say is the point of social media is to create a customer who in turn creates a customer. And that's how we've kind of kept our religion going within an organization like Bloomberg. And with that, I'll pass it over. Thanks, Rob. So the next point is a responsiveness. So the finding here is that one in four digitally active brands claim that the company does not actively solicit customer feedback. That's 25% of the companies that we spoke to. It's kind of a, a shocking number. Um, the interesting thing about responsiveness in, in this framework is that it's actually an internal component of brand strength. So normally we think of responsiveness, we think of social media, we think of getting out there and having conversations with customers or talking to customers. But putting it on the inside of the company is really about listening, bringing it in. What are we actually doing about it? Are we listening? Are we taking this information inside the company and doing anything about it? So that's why it's an internal strength factor, makes it more systemic to the organization, not just a marketing tool. So with that, I'm going to have hand it over to Michael. All right, thanks, Jeff. And so first and foremost, I want to address the fact that, uh, as Jeff said, this is an internal component. And as he just defined, responsiveness is the ability and the desire of the organization to respond to market changes, challenges, opportunities, et cetera. So first and foremost, I want to drive the point that we're not talking about customer service per se. I mean, that's an element of responsiveness, but it's far more than that. And it's got to be a, a more holistic look at the situation. If we view the responsiveness and get the culture of the organization focused internally as a path to innovation and profit. So it really is as a responsiveness and using the, the concept of responding and managing the brand as an avenue to get ahead of the marketplace, creating new categories, uh, focusing on the, the product innovation capabilities that can come from that and really drive the organization to become the next big success factor in the marketplace. So what that really speaks to is that responsiveness really does demand a cultural commitment from the organization internally to adopt and truly embrace social values throughout the organization. And what do I mean by social values? It really means the empathy to actually care about the customers. And so, yes, that's listening externally, but you really have to adopt that, that concept internally, and you really do need to ensure there is that cultural commitment. From that, the empathy to care about your customers, truly care about the customers, then you also have to have the confidence to actually listen to what they are saying. And that's easier said than done at some points because it's, it's not always as easy as you think to actually listen to what's being said because sometimes it's not overall pleasant. And then finally, it's the true courage to respond to what you're hearing and to actually create something out of that. So driving home the concept of this social values inherent inherent across the entire organization internally. That's the only way to truly define yourself as being responsive and managing the brand from that perspective. I mean, one organization, the, the picture, the image that's here is, is the Canadian Red Cross. Canadian Red Cross, after uh, had started a, a real social media uh, adoption of two years ago, to a few years ago, when the tsunami hit in Japan, literally one year ago now, we're on the first anniversary of it just passed, and that day that it happened, they got much faster than they would have plugged into what was happening in this space. And because they were already dabbling in the social media environment and what their response to all that was, was that they ramped up very aggressively surrounding that. They set up a volunteer Twitter group uh, out of that whole situation, which still exists to this day. Some of those followers in their Twitter group, and these were everyday volunteers for the organization. They weren't social media gurus that were out there. Some of them have over 100,000 followers today. Their embracing of the social values, the social media values in their organization means that these volunteer Twitter 
follower uh, advocates for the Red Cross are engaged with these uh, audience out there. So when that next crisis hits, and with the Red Cross's uh, mandate, there will be another crisis. But they're engaged with these people now. They're proactively out front of it, and they've got these relationships. Right off of that tsunami, they had a response rate driven off the social media aspects that drove there in their ROI measurement was really the, the campaign, the raising of funds that they did, and they were able to join based upon their listening, based upon the metrics and tools that they had, be able to prove that this was so effective for them in the response to this crisis that was confronting Japan at that point in time. So when we look at it, there was a time just a few years ago when, when marketers really had the sense that they could, uh, to by and large, uh, were somewhat in control of the brand, were in control of the message. Word of mouth was an issue. It's always been a challenge to some degree, but there was the sense and a reasonable degree of confidence that issues could be overcome through a very protracted and aggressive marketing campaign, advertising campaign, uh, very creative uh, copywriting and, and uh, uh, programs to overcome if there was something negative. Well. In today's world, where there's, as it says here in 2012, well over 2 billion people on the web, well over 1 billion of those people uh, actively social, and you can be absolutely certain that many of those uh, people that are actively social on the web are discussing your business, your brands, your, your industry. And it's a factor that you can no longer ignore, and the fact that you can overcome What's happening in the marketplace through traditional marketing is just not going to be the case. So if you don't embrace the social media aspects of it and the inherent commitment to listen to what's going on, you will be acting in the dark on that. You do need to be embracing the aspect of what is being said out there, what is happening in the, on my brand, on my products, my services, my competitors, my industry, all of these aspects, and the only way you can do that is to ensure that you've got this internal commitment to listen and respond to what's going on in the marketplace. The other image that's there is really just, this is a, an image from a global digital agency that has on, and this is literally a war room, a social media war room. This is from one of the clients of, of ours. It's a Copenhagen location. They have a war room where they literally have the six screens up there where they monitor the social media activity and that, that's the, uh, the listening tool. They're monitoring in real time uh, for their clients what's going on in the social media realm. So they're, they're populating this war room. To, they've, this agency on behalf of their clients have this commitment to ensure that they're always on top of what's happening in the world. <clears throat> So where that brings is really the social, the science of listening and learning. And as Jeff said, there's an inordinate number of tools that are out there, but the fundamental issue comes back to there has to be this commitment internally to listen and to engage in what's happening in the marketplace. If you don't have that internal commitment, if you don't adopt that social value, it's just not going to work if it's not part of the DNA of the organization. So what you see is with that, it goes beyond just listening. The most common aspect that people think about is a customer service application, but it comes right down to uh, innovation driven off of this listening campaign. The actual uh, feedback on pricing issues, the, in the effectiveness of marketing and communication campaigns, uh, obviously customer support issues, engaging directly through this listening campaign. It all focuses around listening. If you don't listen, it's hard to identify who you need to engage with. It's hard to make that next step of actually reaching out and engaging. And from all of that, you turn around and you, biz you build the, the return on all of the investment that you make in that area. And it's at the peril of any organization in this day and age that isn't going to at least be starting on that listening to be able to build that culture of responsiveness. <clears throat> so one aspect of it that quite often comes up, we talked briefly about the Red Cross situation. This is a major situation. This was a global brand that did a major logo change a couple of years ago in uh, October 2010. On a Friday, late in the week, they did a whole rebranding. They launched a new brand, put it up on their web page, put it up on their Facebook page, et cetera. So what you see at the top here, this spider looking, is, is what we call the buzz graph, 
What this is showing, and you see in the bottom the spike in activity that happened around the launch. That's the Friday where you see the first box on the left-hand side. That's the Friday spike in activity uh, surrounding this rebrand, and you just see it went through the roof on that day. And the buzz graph is really by taking, using the listening tool, uh, assessing what are all the words that are associated in those conversations and how do they relate. The stronger the lines, the stronger it is to that central core topic, and you probably can't read that, but the, central, the, the center dot there defines logo. So that was really what was driving all this conversation. The strongest lines which are, are, are blocked out there, you see the words which aren't exactly positive words, backlash, debacle, low change, etc. All these things, there was a real negative react immediately, and it was almost visceral by the part of the marketplace on this Friday for this major global brand. And we probably, most people can recognize what this brand was. I mean, this was the gap when they launched their new brand. And what ended up happening was over that weekend, they were assessing all this data, saw that this, this noise was there, this negative reaction. On Monday, they came out and actually the CEO of The Gap came out and apologized. They reverted to the original brand. They, to this day, still have the original brand. They did not go back to this new brand. And he said, we didn't listen. We didn't do our research up front. We weren't, we weren't attuned. We won't make this mistake, mistake again. And this was a clear example. So you can see on the next, on that Monday, and that's what the next big spike, because it just caused a whole new flurry of activity where people are talking about backlash, revert, scrap, outcry, all these major words. These were the words that were driving the conversation, the common words in that conversation that's going on across thousands and hundreds of thousands of conversation in the social web that was uh, going on. And it caused them, they listened and they responded very quickly. Ideally, they would have listened and, and had that sense before they embarked on this and had done the work in advance so that they didn't have to go through this crisis situation. So, to wrap up very quickly, the idea of listening is more than just customer service. The idea of listening, the tools that are available, if you don't embrace it culturally throughout the entire organization, take it as right as part of your core values in the soul, accepting that you are going to have that empathy, the confidence and the courage to actually respond to what you're hearing. None of us like to hear bad news if it's out there. You need to be able to be willing to listen, truly listen and respond to it and have the courage to actually leverage your business off of all of that. So, Thanks. Michael, I'm glad you mentioned the, the war room slide because we've seen now social listening going far beyond just crisis management and sort of customer service applications. And people are having these war rooms, a lot of our clients are starting to build these things outside of the C-suite. So companies like, like Gatorade, Dell, Cisco, they've got screens outside of the C-suite that are actually monitoring for product and service innovation and feedback um, going into emerging markets. So those sort of insights that are directly tied back to the business in addition to learning about brand and what people are, um, how can we measure the effectiveness of the experiences that we're delivering. So there's a multitude of things that we can now respond to from social listening beyond just crisis and, um, and customer service. So it's, it's nice to see people starting to use these tools as real business and brand building applications. So um, the next point is really around differentiation. Obviously, in the digital space, is, it's, it's crowded. It's, it's tough for brands to stand out. There's a lot of competition, new players, old players. Everyone's out there. So um, we talked to people, and only 13% claim that they audit their competitors on a regular basis. So how are we really understanding, you know, looking outside of our own house, what's happening out there? We can fix our own experience, but how do we know what everybody else is doing? Are we consistently looking out there to see you know, where we need, what we need to do to stand out and create those really world-changing experiences that will um, advance our brand? So over to Jason. You know, how are you guys sorting this out over at Rogers? Great. So um, I spent the last several years running a company called Point Roll in the US, which was really uh, about enabling some of the top brands in the world to run more effective digital marketing campaigns. So I'm used to talking about actually marketer brands like Apple, Ford, uh, Walmart, etc. It's actually interesting, I've been at Rogers for a year now, and I'm sure most of you know Rogers, but it's an incredibly diverse portfolio of traditional media brands in TV, radio, magazines, uh, sports teams, shopping channels. And so uh, a lot of what we've spent time looking at is how do we actually differentiate some of these traditional media brands in a cross-platform, multi-platform world. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd walk you through a couple examples 
a little bit of a different approach, but uh, walk you through how, how some traditional brands are, are, are really starting to evolve and embrace digital and social uh, as we grow. Uh, how many, just curious, how many of you are familiar with City TV from uh, back in the day? Quite a few. So, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, City TV was really well known in, in Toronto and some other markets as a very hyper local brand. City TV would be everywhere in your local communities. So, even before social media or user generated content existed, back 20, 30 years ago, uh, City TV was actually in the local markets. And, you know, there, there's an example here of something called Speaker's Corner. I'm not sure if anyone remembers this, but uh, incredibly basic in the early days on the web. But this is really where you could go uh, onto a corner of Toronto and actually go on camera, speak to the world, tell them what you were interested in, tell them what you wanted, share your point of view, and that was actually put up on TV. So you know, it was kind of interesting to see some UGC and some social before that even happened, and even Mike Myers happened to be on Speaker's Corner, I guess, at some point. But uh, I guess you know, when you look at the future and, and how we've evolved and, and try to take this brand across channel, what we've tried to do, and Scott Moore, who runs uh, Rogers Broadcasting, has really focused on taking City TV national, enhancing the brand to be much of our market leader, higher quality content from Hollywood, and also creating a lot more uh, Canadian content, both original and adaptations of, of American successful content. So uh, if we look uh, a little bit forward, I mean, we've really broadened out where now, in, in some cases, upwards of 10% of the viewing of some of the primetime TV shows is online. Uh, we have tons of usage of uh, you know, local community type content where people are engaging and uh, engaging while uh, the shows are actually going on, like breakfast television in the mornings or City Line. Uh, we also have launched spin-offs around City News uh, and some other areas. And we've taken all this cross-platform too, so one of our most successful apps is a social stream app where if you happen to be watching shows like The Bachelor or others, uh, you can actually comment and thousands and thousands of people will be chatting, sharing, uh, tweeting and so on at the same time. And a couple, uh, so a couple other examples. So, so what I wanted to focus on was something called uh, Canada's Got Talent, which when I came back to Canada, I guess a year ago, uh, I knew Americans were big on reality TV. I wasn't aware as to how much Canadians watched it as well. And so uh, what we decided to do was create a cross-brand, multi-platform uh, you know, content uh, initiative called Canada's Got Talent. Uh, we weren't sure how big it could possibly be, but from the beginning, this was the first time I think in Rogers Media history where all the various groups sat together across TV, radio, print, digital, et cetera, uh, to think about how do we actually build this out and leverage all of the various social and digital channels to make this a big success. So uh, fast forwarding a little bit, you know, this has now been the number one uh, most watched premiere in City TV's history, 1.5 million viewers. From the beginning, we actually, uh, before the even show started playing, we were really deep into social, trying to generate interest in auditions. We actually had 20,000 auditions coming through the website and through a partnership with YouTube uh, and through Facebook. And we even had a special partnership where people who, who auditioned on YouTube could actually get a spot in the final, and there's a special contest there. And it's just amazing to see that 20,000, believe it or not, uh, working in conjunction with some of our American producers, was number one around the world in terms of number of people submitting on, uh, online audition submissions, even compared to the US. And so, uh, you know, hu huge engagement. I think what all this comes down to, in my mind, is a lot around engagement. Um, helping, how do you connect with that user across all these platforms? We actually see a lot more TV tune in, TV viewing uh, as, it, as, a, as a result from engagement online as well. Uh, we also uh, really uh, tightly integrated our sponsors, such as Tim Hortons and others, into this across all platforms uh, from product placement to social to, to others as well. And so just, just one example here of how uh, we've tried to take this to the next level. It's been very successful so far and uh, you'll look for a lot more from, from Rogers on this front. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is we had 700, we've had hundreds of thousands of people download the apps, a lot of co-viewing activity, trending Twitter topics, and uh, we actually had 700,000 people buzzing people off the show from their iPad app and acting as their own judge. And the cool thing there is it's not only a fun game and we're working a lot on gamification and, and uh, co-viewing and so on, we're actually tracking everything. So the second point beyond insight, uh, engagement is insights. We're tracking every level of detail that's happening in the social sphere, how people are engaging with these apps, using that to determine what, 
how we should drive programming in the future, how we should drive advertising and so on. So a lot of this comes back to cross-platform analytics and insights. And the, the last um, point I wanted to leave you with was we also recently completely relaunched uh, another big brand of ours called Sportsnet. Uh, historically, it was a TV uh, channel with uh, you know, a certain brand and a certain focus. Uh, we've completely relaunched it in the first five, fully five-platform brand in Canada across TV, radio, magazine, digital, mobile, uh, with a new, completely new look and feel, completely new tagline across all the platforms called Fueled by Fans. And the reason there is when you look at differentiation uh, in the competition, you know, there's some great sports content out there, there's statistics, et cetera. We felt there was a real gap in the marketplace and did a lot of research uh, leveraging the social sphere, digital sphere as well. And we found that there was a really unique place for uh, more fans getting engaged with the brand, uh, storytelling, uh, involvement. There are a lot of fanatic, fanatical uh, sports fans in Canada when it comes to hockey and other areas. So uh, this is a huge area of focus for us. How do we engage with those fans? throughout the day across different platforms, throughout the week, throughout the month, how do we target them with appropriate content, advertising, learn from that. Uh, this is part of an evolution, obviously. We still have a lot of work to do here in the social sphere and so on, but uh, definitely a multi-platform uh, area of focus. We also launched Sportsnet Magazine as part of that, and people said, you know, it's a digital age, and you're, you're launching a magazine, and I certainly spent the last decade or so trying to convince people to shift dollars from print to digital, but it's interesting when you're in a company like this and you see the power of all these assets working together. We've had huge success with Sportsnet Magazine with a Canadian bent, more of an engaged, passionate fan approach to content, uh, tying in digital and social. A lot of the story ideas come from, come from fans and the editorial teams are all deeply integrated for the first time at Rogers. So a lot more to come here, but I think what I would leave you with from my perspective is when we think about a multi-platform world, it's obviously the same customer, the same consumer. Uh, we really are trying to differentiate by engaging very deeply with those consumers, uh, whether it's through City or Sportsnet or any of our other brands, across all these platforms. And then we're also investing very heavily in insights and trying to be the leaders in this market around how, how well we can understand our consumers, what they're interested in, and how we can parlay that into uh, new content, new opportunities, and, and advertiser uh, success as well. And we've seen huge uh, success so far in some of the metrics, as I mentioned, TV viewing, um, online uh, video growth, social uh, viewership, still a long way to go, but uh, a lot of progress there. So we're also building out a lot of internal uh, audience management databases and platforms to leverage all these insights in different ways. So uh, just, just a quick example of how uh, a big traditional media company like Rogers is trying to uh, leverage these new platforms to differentiate. Great, thank you, Jason. And, and um, our last point from the research that we want to share was around consistency. This is a huge problem, the more channels that are born on an almost daily basis in the digital space. It goes back to that point about aligning with tools versus aligning with behavior. So what are we trying to influence? What are we trying to say? What's our world changing point of view? And how do we push that through our experience versus starting with tools, like what is my Facebook strategy, what is my Twitter strategy, as opposed to what is my brand strategy and how do I use it? The result is that one in every three people we spoke to believe that their brand experience is inconsistent across digital touch points. So it's an understandable problem. I think everybody knows how it happens, but it's, it's one of the major challenges that brands struggle with. So we wanted to talk to Kobe today about one of the sort of more recognizable brand platforms for consistency and how you guys are you know, keeping things uh, to be a consistent story across channels. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so at MasterCard, many of you are very familiar with our bl uh, brand platform of Priceless. And I mean, Priceless is an international brand platform that's activated across all uh, global markets. When we look at the messaging, I mean, we started this in 1997 and we still do everything that we can through our insights and our research to, make, to remain relevant to the audience. Um, looking back at how we've evolved, uh, we've expanded, uh, but you know, in 15 years we have to look at a way to continue to remain relevant. So when Priceless started in 1997, and, and for many years, it was all about commentary, about finding the pricelessness of certain uh, experiences uh, or certain things. Um, and it's really evolved after 15 years later to become more about not just examining and identifying priceless experiences, but actually facilitating priceless experiences. And it's moved uh, and expanded to become more than just 
an advertising campaign, but more importantly, it's informed uh, and, and become a brand platform uh, where it's informed our sponsorships, uh, where we're involved in uh, MasterCard Brit Awards or the Grammys uh, or World MasterCard Fashion Week, uh, where we are facilitating co-brands with other partners like Amazon, uh, where it's actually where Priceless is driving product innovation, uh, uh, you know, new developments, new partnerships. So it's really become something that's interlaced itself with all aspects of our organization. So if you're looking at digital, um, which is, you know, 10 years ago, if you watched Jay Leno or you watched any programming on television, there would always be a homage paid towards Priceless uh, in TV and radio. Uh, in all media types and when you look at social today priceless is spoken about all the time if you were to uh, do a search right now on Twitter for hashtag priceless you'd see tens of thousands of tweets uh, where people are tagging their posts with priceless uh, sometimes it's video content sometimes it's photos of their kids people commenting about uh, experiences all the time so we're looking at these conversations that are happening in the social sphere uh, and we're looking at ways to continue to extend our brand into the digital space. Um, and that's not just in English, that's in all global languages. And sometimes what's being spoken about isn't necessarily attached to our brand, and sometimes it is. So we're looking at ways to continue to extend uh, Priceless into the digital sphere. So what I wanted to do is actually talk about three different uh, platforms that we have right now uh, in Canada uh, that are relevant to talk more about what we're doing with Priceless and keeping consistency across all of our uh, initiatives. So we recently last year launched uh, Priceless Toronto, which is part of a three-city program that is expanding globally around uh, facilitating Priceless experiences with our cardholders. So at the, at the high level, I mean, you're going to uh, a game with your friends uh, at the box at the, uh, at the ACC with Bobby Orr or you're having um, you know, a priceless experience where you're going to the boiler house in the distillery district and you are uh, having a five course uh, meal customized by the chef um, for you and only you uh, and extending you know, to front row access to World Mascar Fra Fashion Week or backstage access. So we built a platform that allows us to facilitate with our cardholders uh, priceless experiences and because experiences are innately social I mean, we have people going out and talking about it on a regular basis, talking about the experience that they had on the CN Tower Edge Walk, that they're excited that they just booked uh, the first uh, 9 a.m. booking on, you know, at the end of May when the CN Tower Edge Walk opens up, or they're talking about the access and experience they had because they were at the Leafs game uh, or a, Leafs pr a private Leafs practice at the MasterCard Center for Hockey Excellence, where just because they were a card holder, they flashed their card and they were able to take their son to watch a private game. Um, so we've really used a digital platform to create awareness for uh, all these priceless experiences, and then we take all those conversations and harness it through all of our social channels, be it Facebook or um, uh, you know, Foursquare or even uh, Twitter, which is a big, a big piece of the conversation. Looking at other pieces of what we do, I mean, another big part uh, where we see prices really living is in recruitment. Uh, so, you know, we decided that we wanted to treat uh, internship uh, as a youth engagement piece. What can we do uh, with youth engagement and tie it into our recruitment practices when we're looking for summer inter uh, interns? So, we created this priceless internship where we went to market uh, to the student population, and this was uh, targeted to Ontario, around, hey, we want to find the best and the brightest digital savvy interns. Um, tell us why you deserve to be our priceless intern. And we were able to spur conversation um, and get people talking and, and really uh, take a more of a tongue-in-cheek approach to uh, approaching um, an internship at MasterCard, so things like being able to uh, afford imported beer, priceless. Uh, you know, being able to update your status at the office, priceless. Like things that uh, really connected our brand with the experience that we're trying to uh, exemplify in working at MasterCard. And this was a huge success. I mean, we had people talk, uh, submitting all kinds of videos, uh, raps, spoken word poems, essays, websites telling us what it would mean to them to be a priceless intern. And again, we were able to take all of those conversations and harness them in our 
uh, social channels. And finally, a, th a third case which is uh, really relevant right now is, as you probably are all aware, last week was uh, our inaugural title sponsorship of World MasterCard Fashion Week. Uh, so we look at, you know, World MasterCard Fashion Week is a very well, a very well established initiative uh, in the city. Uh, you have designers from all over the country coming to showcase uh, their uh, work, but at the same time, it's very much a trade. Uh, initiative as well. So what can we do to bring the pricelessness of that experience to uh, the consumer that can't sit in the audience? So we looked at being able to uh, enlist um, you know, rich video content, bring in rich, uh, rich content providers and bloggers to share their experiences um, at World Mascar Fashion Week through our social channels, through the web presences that we have and extending that out not just to the pricelessness of uh, World Mascar Fashion Week and all that surrounds it, but creating a retail program that really helps local retailers in Queen West or King West or Yorkville be able to showcase their work as well. Um, so, I mean, here are three very different examples of how we've been able to continuously extend uh, the brand platform that is priceless. And as we continue to evolve, um, we're really excited about what it'll mean for us in the next 10 years when it comes to being able to talk to our consumers and our cardholders about creating those priceless experiences for them. Thanks a lot, Kumi. So really quickly, so we can get to some questions. Um, just to sum everything up, what we've heard, um, try not to start with the tools. Let's think about behaviors before we dive into thinking about how we're going to use tools. Let's think about the behaviors that we want to understand and change. Um, say it. Say something meaningful. Have a world-changing point of view. Don't go out there and have mundane conversations in the social space. Have something important to say. Um, be it. Include your employees. They're excited to be part of it. Give them a voice. They'll make you better, and they'll tell your story for you and do it. We just talked about experience. You know, don't just talk about it. Deliver the experience and people will say great things about you. So let's um, take some time to ask these guys any questions you might have about what you've heard. Yeah. Thank you. Can you, does it work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you for sharing your experiences. I'm Geneviève Bastelgui. I'm a faculty member at uh, McGill, and i really interested in um, uh, the teaching and researching of social media. Now, you focus your talk in, on, on this aspect of your relationship with consumer and going from, you know, uh, reaching more to having a deeper, richer experience. Now, do you have anything to say about how you as organization also have to connect to other organizations and how the social media is playing a role there, which I think is probably different than with the consumers, but what's, I know, Kobe, you, you mentioned you also are in charge of the B2B, um, so I don't know if there's something you have to say about how different it is uh, to reach organization than to consumers. Uh, sure, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, thank you. Um, Especially with social, there's a lot of appetite for conversations between organizations. So when you look at our partners, such as our merchant partners like Tim Hortons or our issuers like BMO, um, they all are doing the same thing as us. They're looking at ways to build a stronger relationship uh, with their consumers. But at the end of the day, a big part of social is what kind of relevant content can I share with my audience? So the approach that we take at MasterCard is we are best friends, if you will, with all of the uh, community managers at each of these organizations. Because the way we look at it is there's content that they're putting out that's relevant to our audience just as much as there's stuff that we're putting out that's relevant to their audience. So. Uh, for, from the B2B perspective, we're very, we are continuing to build relationships with various merchant partners, issuers, um, to help exchange information and content, and in, at the end of the day, it benefits all of us. Um, and we found it to be extremely, um, extremely valuable. And I just, a uh, couple of other points on that. It's not only dealing with consumers by any stretch. I mean, there's all sorts of organizations, uh, 
corporate world that has to be, whether it's social activity, whether it's social engagement, whether it's organizations that have uh, uh, special interest groups that are creating, that are raising issues that are relevant to that company, very plugged into the social media realm to be able to stay on top and listen and engage on that front. You see it in the investor relations space and it's growing significantly, it's dealing with shareholders, analysts, the street on that side. So social media applications and the listening and engagement on that front. So in B2B, it's, uh, when we're talking customers, uh, certainly from my perspective, it's, it's dealing whether it's a, a consumer products group or a retail oriented entity or a straight B2B and a straight B2B we have mining organizations and natural resource companies. They're not exactly selling to a retail customer per se, but they're very actively growing in their social media responsiveness initiatives. And I'd, I'd echo that too. I mean, Bloomberg, um, when, I, when I first started, if you think about Bloomberg, it's really not B2C at all. Um, you know, it, for 30 years, it's really focused on this unique collection of, of customers, institutions around the world. Um, but as it's acquired things like Business Week and dot coms and uh, other new businesses, it's, it's expanded that audience. But what we have stayed true to is that kind of core that we have um, that's really centered on the terminal. And those folks are just as interested in social in some ways, even more so, because they're really trying to understand uh, when they do their business day to day, what's the impact of social having on it? What's the impact having on a, a ticker, on a company? Um, global news, data, analytics. Um, so all these things that we would think, um, you know, maybe are just the domain and purview of, of, of consumer packaged goods companies or strictly media companies or whatever, now is coming of age for institutions, for other businesses and how you relate with them is gonna be absolutely critical. Just, just one thing I'd add as well is that it's not just at the macro level when you're looking at B2B with big brands. I mean, we did a program that's ending this week, a Stylicity program, where we partner with 150 local merchants, uh, retailers, and spas, and restaurants in the Toronto district. And we featured, we had bloggers go out and tell, you know, write about uh, their experiences at the Gladstone Hotel or Doll Bar or various restaurants and share that with our audience. But what was really interesting is that that was amazing to get the merchants out there because they started using the, our channels to promote themselves and to create more awareness about their offerings. So they looked at us being a pipeline for them, but also they love the opportunity to be able to share what they're up to, you know, the unique styles that, th that they're selling, the unique designers that they're um, uh, listing. So it, there's definitely a, a B2B element in a lot of the things that we do. Adam, I'm from an agency from, uh, from Nova Scotia. Uh, just a question, any type of research has a bias, any type of research, uh, whoever is responding in it, it does not ever rep necessarily represent the customer. So I'm wondering if you have any inside information, what is the gap between the kind of research, the kind of information you get from social media, whether it's for Facebook or anywhere else, to what the real customer is in the retail marketplace? You guys hear that all right? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it, no matter uh, what, social media is one channel, one avenue, and there's many channels within social media. So uh, one of the aspects of any social media strategy is you need to really try to learn and understand where your audience is, is populating and where are they showing up. So that's a critical piece of it. But by definition, you, the more comprehensive your social media listening campaign, the more, the more wholesome or fulsome your data set will be and the more accurate your picture will be. And that, getting back to, that depends on if you're trying to do it piecemeal across the board and, and try to manually go out and do it, it's, extra, it's impossible to get that holistic picture, um, you know. Not to be too self-serving in the comment, but the simple fact is, is that a, uh, the services that actually, that's all that they do, that it's uh, literally, we, our, our products that we scan, uh, we've got 60, 70 terabytes of data that we've aggregated across the social media world. This is something that you, no human could ever stay on top of that. So if you want a holistic picture, you need to try, and even then you need to set your queries and what you're looking for 
properly to narrow in. So it's a challenge. That's the challenge of social media is trying to get that. But then you also have other avenues that people are still populating in. So yeah, I, I, I think we're on, on the verge of, I mean, people have talked about big data and all that this year. Um, it, trends aside, I think we're on the verge of really starting to understand how to, to, to kind of reconnect with our customers, whether they're B2B or not B2B. When I was at Sears, one of the goals I held myself to was if we could get and use social media data to make us feel less like this big behemoth company and more like the local shopkeeper, uh, that would have been a huge win. So I would echo it with the same, same point, which is um, you know, making sure that your data doesn't exist by itself is the best way to make sure you end up with a lot of apps. And that's the biggest challenge companies are going to have, which is taking this information, sifting through it, and figuring out really what matters now. And more than that is figuring out how you bridge all the internal gaps within an organization to make sure that data gets to the right people in the right time frame. Otherwise, it does have a shelf life, and it will go away, and it won't have any impact. And the only thing I'd add to that is what I saw, what I saw in the U.S., we aggregate data from all different types of sources, and I saw that there wasn't one piece of data or research or insights that was a holy grail. I mean, I think when you add them all up and try to create a profile and try to create an understanding of what that consumer or that segment really wants, uh, you can leverage contextual data of what they're actually looking at, social data in terms of what they're saying to you directly, uh, also data in terms of what they're saying to their friends and sharing. And you know, sometimes people say they want something and they actually, their behavior is different than that. So I think it was really trying to pull those disparate pieces of information together and to try to, try to create some insights out of that. But, but the social side really helped uh, make it more granular and pinpoint uh, some of their more direct feedback and needs. I would say just to put a brand perspective on it, there is also um, social listening is not a replacement for traditional research or other forms of data. And that brand can be the thread through everything that lines things up. So when you think about what you're trying to stand for, you have certain attributes or certain messages that you're trying to get across through your experiences and that they can play back those experiences to you. And if you align, if the way that you listen is really specifically aligned with your messaging or your marketing, you can start to understand whether or not people, it's actually resonating. So that could be the thread. And that, that thread also carries through, through to traditional research. So you can start to align things like focus group, industry knowledge, what you stand for, what you deliver as an experience. So to, to really use brand as a thread to, um, to link all of the, the insights together. We're out of time, but thanks so much. And uh, these guys will be here for the next couple of days. So if you have any other questions, you know, we, can, we can chat off stage as well. So thanks very much. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. Well done.